Father in heaven, I just want to pause. I just want to ask that you'd be with us, that you would lead us, that you'd guide us, Lord. Lord, I know I need your strength. I pray that you'd give me clarity of mind, that you'd speak to me and through me, Father God. Lord, we just pray that you would forgive us of our sins, that you'd cleanse us, that nothing would stand between us and you. And that's what the work of atonement is. The work of the sanctuary is about drawing us into that union with you, Lord. So please let nothing stand between us. And so in this moment, as we study your word again, we pray that we would hear your voice speaking to our hearts, Lord. We're just so thankful for your goodness. We're thankful for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, in part one, I made this statement that's not original to me. You'll see there Dwight Nelson uh, made this point that the maker of all things loves and wants you. This statement is as true today as it was when Jesus created Adam and Eve. I mean, just think about it for a moment. God created Adam and Eve, right, to be with them. He was their creator. He was their lover. He wanted uh, to be with them. And so he, he made them to be with them. And it says true today that he wants to be with, he, with us. He loves us. He wants to be with us as much today as, as, as when he created Adam and Eve. He wants to be with us as much as when he delivered Israel from Egypt. He wants to be with us as much as when Jesus came as a human being, Emmanuel, God with us. And as I have already said, God made us because he wants to be with us. It's kind of sad to think about the reality that a lot of times we see neglect neglected kids in this world or abandoned kids right we've been given such a special god given ability to procreate to bring life into this world and sadly some of the children too many of the children in our world are either neglected or abandoned but this is not how it is with god god did not set this world in motion he did not create us and then withdraw and abandon us god loves us <clears throat> so very much. He made us to be with us. I want to read this quote from the book um, God With Us by John Peckham. It says, From beginning to end, the story of Scripture is the story of God with us. The story of God's special presence that was first established then ruptured, then renewed by covenant, then with us in a new way with the first advent of Christ, God with us in the flesh, then with, then with us again in a new way with the work of the Holy Spirit as the Comforter. And finally, will be restored to its original heights when Christ comes again. So in a nutshell, we see this sweep and this idea every step of the way, God is wanting to be with us. He's wanting to be in union with us. The maker of all things loves and wants you. This is a point that we must always remember and learn to accept, embrace, and be transformed by the love of God. I think sometimes we forget how easy it is, or how hard it is, to actually accept love. I mean, just think about the challenges that even exist in some of our homes and, and how we see barriers that happen either between the husband and the wife or between parents and children and how there can be these, these barriers towards loving one another. Or even if you're in a workplace and you feel goodwill towards a coworker or a boss, but you have a hard time expressing, or maybe that coworker has a hard time express, accepting the love that you express or the respect and the care and, and whatever the goodwill that you're trying to express towards them. It's no different in our world today or in our relationship with God is that we need to realize and we need to not only remember 
that the maker of all things loves and wants us. But we need to learn to accept and embrace and be transformed by the love of God. So today, we're going to look at the importance of covenant, the commandments, and Christ's life as the pinnacle of the story arc of Scripture. This arc of God trying to reconnect us. And all along the way, He's wanting to be with us and to draw closer and closer to us. The Exodus story, let's go to Exodus chapter 19. On closer examination, it establishes the importance of covenants. A lot of times when we think of Exodus, especially Exodus 20, we think of the Ten Commandments. And oftentimes we miss and we don't appreciate the deeper connection and importance of the covenant between God and Israel and how that was related to the Ten Commandments. We're going to read a few verses here. Follow along as I read. I'm reading from the New English Translation. Exodus 19, beginning in verse 1. Just including verse 1 to give us a little time stamp here. It says, In the third month after Israel went out from the land of Egypt, on the very day they came to the desert of Sinai. I'm not going to read the rest there in verse 2. But the point is, this is approximately the timing of this event. The timing of what we're about to study here is about three months after the actual exodus of God delivering His people from Egypt. And there's so much in that painful story where we see God's power, where we see His deliverance, we see His love. We can't get into that story today, but, but here again we see Three months after they actually left, three months after uh, crossing uh, the Red Sea, uh, they find themselves here in the desert of Sinai. And then verse 3 says, Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain. Thus you will tell the house of Jacob and declare to the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I lifted you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Here, not the exact same language we see when we read of the prophecy in Isaiah and its mention in Matthew that, that, that God will come. He will come as a baby, Emmanuel, God with us. But we see the same imagery, the same idea that That God is delivering His people to bring them to Himself. Verse 5. And now, if you will diligently listen to me and keep my what? What does your version say? My covenant. My covenant. So now we're starting to see here that this idea of a covenant is mentioned. And perhaps we don't have a good grasp on what covenant is all about. But we're going to at least introduce the idea and explore it a little bit today. So again, from the top of verse 5, and now if you will diligently listen to me and keep my covenant, then, so there's a condition, right? If, then, then you will be my special possession out of all the nations, for all the earth is mine, and you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you will speak to Israel. Continuing in verse 7, to the Israelites. So Moses came and summoned the elders of Israel. He set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together, All that the Lord has commanded, we will we will do. So Moses brought the words of the people back to the Lord. I mean, there's so much packed in here. And perhaps you've heard sermons on this this agreement, this covenant that Israel entered into with God. They're revealed. God reveals through Moses to the people His will, His commandments. And there's multiple interactions along the way here of God revealing partial, you know, part of His will. um, Or His will at least in summary, and then getting into more details. And along the way, there's this interaction between God and Moses and the people and back and forth. This is the initial instance of this. This is known. Some of your Bibles may actually 
put a subtitle to it. Uh, but chapter 19 is actually the establishment of the covenant with Israel. And to zoom back out, just in case uh, some of us are not familiar with the details of covenant, God had established uh, covenants at different times with his uh, followers in the past. Uh, perhaps the most well-known covenant would have been with Abraham, right? And then it was reestablished uh, with Isaac and with Jacob. And then eventually there's this big period of time where Israel goes into Egypt and becomes slave. And then when they come back out, here we see the establishment, or we could say the reestablishment of God's covenant with his people. So this is significant. This is not something that can be just kind of ignored and just feel like, okay, let's quickly get to the Ten Commandments. No, this is this precedes the Ten Commandments and, and the Ten Commandments should be understood in the context of this covenant relationship that is being formed with God. And here we see after we read verse 8 that the people agreed, they agreed to enter into a covenant with God. And it was only through a special covenant that, that the relationship with God and with humanity could be restored. So that's a key point that we can't skip over quickly. If there is no covenant, there is no relationship. Because the covenant is the way that God is restoring Himself to His people. And the better way to say it is because it's, God's not the one that ever left, right? God is working on our behalf to restore the relationship that we broke, that we lost. And He uses covenants in order to to do this. The covenants between God and His people, it's a special agreement, like a marriage covenant. And if we look at the kind of immediate context of Exodus 19 through to, and we're going to be turning very soon uh, to Exodus 34, so you may want to jump ahead. But as we look at the context from Exodus 19 through to Exodus 34, we see that something very sad, very tragic happens near the end of that kind of section. And that's in Exodus 32, where Israel makes a golden calf, and then they worship this golden calf. I mention this because this ends up signifying... The reality that now the covenant is broken. They had just finished saying in Exodus 19, all that the Lord has said that we will do. In Exodus 20 comes the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before you. You shall not make you know, any images and you shall not bow down to them. And then by Exodus 32, they sing and they break the very commitment that they promised. All that the Lord has said we will do, which includes not bowing down and worshiping other gods. And so like a marriage covenant, the covenant between God and His people is broken in Exodus 32 because of this very serious sin of worshiping the golden calf. And we can appropriately call it adultery. In the spiritual relationship, the marriage commitment between God and His people, they had committed adultery. Individually and collectively, our relationship with God is like a marriage. It's like a marriage relationship, a marriage covenant. Oftentimes when we talk about marriage, we don't necessarily refer to it as a covenant, but it truly is. It's more than just a contract. It's a relational covenant that we enter into for better or for worse, right? For richer, for poor. We're willing to be committed through the hardest challenges that we will face in that marriage. And so both individually and collectively, our relationship with God is like a marriage relationship. It's like a covenant. And there's some powerful verses in the Bible that back that up. The first one is Isaiah 54, verse 5. For the Lord, for your maker is your... What does it say? Your maker is your husband. Is it on the screen? It's on the screen. The maker is your husband, okay? The Lord of hosts is His name, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of the whole earth. In the New Testament we find, For I am jealous, jealous for you with godly 
jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one, what's the word? Husband, one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Over and over again, we see these metaphors, these, these symbols of us being in a marriage relationship with Christ. And truthfully, if we have a good relationship with God, an intimate relationship with God, we actually can have a deeper relationship with Him than we could with even a spouse, with any other human being. That's the type of relationship that God wants to have with us. And it's that very relationship that, that Israel broke. They committed adultery in Exodus 32. But then as kind of like bookends between this, this story of the giving of the law, this relationship that is broken because they broke the law, we see we now come to Exodus 34. Exodus 34, and we'll begin in verse 8. And here we see the covenant mentioned again. And again, if you have subtitles in your Bible, it might say, Covenant renewed or covenant restored. It was established in Exodus 19. Moses is away with God for a period of 40 days, and, and the people of Israel are like, what? We don't know what's happened with Moses. And they're like, We're going to come up with our own God. They break that covenant, and we see it reestablished in Exodus 34, verses 8 to 12. Moses quickly bowed to the ground and worshiped and said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord go among us. For we are a stiff-necked people. Pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. The fascinating thing, and I touch on this in part one, the fascinating thing here is that as, as, as the, after the incident of of the worship of the golden calf took place, Moses is interceding and he's mediating and he's saying, God, don't abandon these people. These are your people. And it's kind of interesting. God will say to Moses, these are your people. And, God, and Moses will say back to God, no, they're your people. Don't abandon them. Don't leave them. But God had every right to abandon them. They had committed adultery. They had broken the covenant kind of interesting as we think about adultery as we think about divorce I'm just sharing this as food for thought I'm not trying to point the finger out I don't know uh, everyone's situation uh, or may perhaps family member's situation but it's interesting Jesus says that in the law of Moses he allowed for divorce because of the hardness of what the hardness of their hearts the hardness of their hearts but here we see with God, God's heart is not hard. Even though he was hurt, even though he was rejected, we can't understand that in human terms. We're just using human terms. And he had every right to abandon his people. Ultimately, he did not because God, his compassion fails not. Amen? As we looked at in Lamentations 3 earlier this morning. So God is willing. Even though Moses has to intercede, God, Moses has to mediate and Moses is a type of Christ, as many of us are familiar with. And he continues, and we kind of see, in this immediate context, we kind of see that verse 8 here, verses 8 and 9, is that last uh, moment, so to speak, in this particular story where Moses is inter in interceding and, and imploring God again, Go among us! Don't abandon us! Don't leave us! He's asking in his terms, he's saying, renew the relationship, renew the covenant. And he admits, he confesses, we are stiff-necked people. This is verse 9. Pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. And I can't say much on that, but that's a beautiful ending to verse 9. He's saying, let us be your people to be with you forever. Let us be your inheritance your people and this is God's response in verse 10 he said see I am going to make a covenant before all your people 
I will do wonders such as, such as has, has not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. All the people among whom you live will see the work of the Lord, for it is a fearful thing that I am doing with you. Verse 11. Obey what I am commanding you this day. I am going to drive out before you the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the per Perizzite, or per uh, yeah, Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite. Be careful not to make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest it become a snare among you. So the powerful thing about this section is we actually see a contrast between two types or two opportunities, as it were, for covenant. God is restoring, He's renewing His covenant with Israel, and He's saying, don't break the covenant again, and don't make a covenant with these other nations. I want to be in this unique relationship with you. And if, and if you will enter into this re unique relationship with me, this committed relationship, I will do wonders such as have not been done in all the earth. I mean, that's amazing what God is offering, what He is promising. And all of this is on the basis that He desires to be with us, to be united with us. Now, the detail that we don't want to miss, and we've established it, is the relationship between the covenants and the commandments. So again, just to bring some parallels really quickly, Exodus 19, we see that, that God meets with Moses. All right? And the covenant or the commandments are cut. And this time God cuts them. And He cuts them out of the stone. And we understand it to be out of the sapphire stone of, of, of His throne. And so God cuts out the commandments. He makes a covenant in Exodus 19. As Moses comes down, and I believe it's at the end of 31, chapter 31 going to chapter 32, where the sin of worshiping the calf takes place, Moses throws down the commandments and they break, signaling really the breaking of the covenant. He smashes the commandments. And then we see here, and if we zoom back up here to Exodus 34, we see that Moses said to Moses, the Lord said to Moses, this is Exodus 34, verse 1, cut out two tablets of, tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were written on the first which you smashed. So here we see it. At the beginning of the covenant being established, there's a set of Ten Commandments. At the end, after they had been broken and smashed and the covenant had been broken for it to be renewed again, the commandments had to be restored. And then he goes on to say, and the imagery is, is really the same that you kind of see there's so many parallels in verses 2 uh, through 4 when God appeared uh, on Mount Sinai to the children of Israel. It says, be prepared in the morning and go up in the morning to Mount Sinai and station yourself for me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come up with you. Do not let anyone be seen anywhere on the mountain, not even the flocks or the herds may graze in front of that, that mountain. So Moses cut out two tablets of stone like the first. Early in the morning he went up to Mount Sinai just as the Lord had commanded him and he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. So there we see it. When this covenant is being restored, God's Ten Commandments is at the center of this. And I just want to point out something that I think is interesting. Maybe you can share this with someone. Uh, but Moses is hiking up and down Mount Sinai, right? How old is Moses at this point? Over 70. He's over 80. He's over 80, right? Sometimes you think like, well, I'm 70, I'm 80, you know. I need to take a back seat. I mean, Moses is not only one of the most important leaders in all of biblical history. But he's also physically active, hiking up and down this mountain. And he lives, God obviously blesses his life abundantly, and he lives um, 
for another 40 years while he's with Israel wandering in the wilderness. But anyways, that's just a side note. So again, the point that I don't want to miss here is that the covenants and the commandments cannot be separated. God wants to be in covenant relationship with us. And we could say that the basis or the foundational element for establishing a covenant is the Ten Commandments, is the Decalogue. And we see that again here because when it's renewed in Exodus 34, we see that the Ten Commandments are front and center. The basis, the foundation of our covenant relationship with God is the Ten Commandments. And if we slip, flip probably forward, you probably have to turn your page, maybe you don't, to Exodus 34, verse 28, we see this. If it wasn't clear before, it should be abundantly clear in verse 28. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. So again, when the covenant was established at first, he was up on the mountain with God for 40 days and 40 nights. And when the covenant is renewed he's, and re uh, restored, he's up on the mountain for another 40 days and 40 nights. Two 40-day periods that we understand as it's spelt out here that he did not drink water. He did not eat bread. And during that time, God wrote on the tablets the words of what? The words of the covenant. The words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So we wouldn't say, it's not necessary to say, and it's probably too, too uh, yeah, it's not quite accurate for sure, to say that the Ten Commandments are the covenants. It's not quite, but they're, they're so intertwined, they're so intermingled. Uh, we don't have a covenant with God without the Ten Commandments. Recently, I found this exceptional statement from Patriarchs and Prophets. It says, Here Israel was to receive the most wonderful revelation ever made by God to man. And when it says here, it's referring to Exodus 19 and the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. All right? So here Israel was to receive the most wonderful revelation ever made by God to men. Here the Lord had gathered his people that he might impress upon them the sacredness of his requirements by declaring with his own voice his holy law. Great and radical changes were to be wrought in them for the degrading influences of servitude and the long-continued association with idolatry had left their mark upon the habits, their habits upon, uh, left their mark upon habits and character. God was working to lift them to a higher moral level by giving them a knowledge of himself. As I read that statement at first, I was like, wow, like, how can this be that, back, let me back up if I can do that. How can this be that, Mo, that, that Israel was to receive the most wonderful revelation ever made by God to man? How could this be expressed in reference to the giving of the law and the Ten Commandments? Because when we think about it, the incarnation, we would have to say that God becoming human, humanity, becoming in human flesh to be God with us, Emmanuel, that that would be the greatest and most wonderful revelation ever made by God to man. How could you say that this is when we clearly know that Jesus coming in human flesh is the most amazing revelation ever? How could it, how could it be? How could this be elevated above that? And while this could easily be seen as a contradiction or a false statement, I believe that a diligent, a diligent Bible student will recognize that the laws of a country or of an organization reveal the character and the values of the law makers. We could say it like this. Laws reveal the character and values of the law makers. Jesus taught us. He taught us that Love for God and love for man is the basis of all laws. Let's go to our scripture reading. Matthew 22, 
37 to 40. Matthew 22. And I'm reading from the New English Translation. Matthew 22, verses 20, no, 37, 37 to 40. Jesus said to him, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend or hang on these two commandments. All right? So God's law, God's word can basically be boiled down to these two principles, these two commandments, these two values, love God and love God man. If we go back to this statement, the law reveals the character, the values of the law makers. And in the case of God's holy law, it reveals his character. It reveals his values. It reveals who he is. And so when Israel is standing before Mount Sinai and God comes to meet with them and he has to cover himself in a dark cloud. Otherwise they would be consumed with his glory. He reveals his, his character. He reveals his love. He reveals his values to his people that he is entering into covenant with. Matthew 27 shows us clearly that love, love for God and love for man is the basis of all laws. The essential, we'll go to this statement, the essential nature of the law, the Ten Commandments, reveals the God of all love and all justice. And let's just skip, skip back quickly. If you want to hold your hand in Matthew, we've got one more verse to look at in Matthew, but let's just skip back quickly to Exodus 34. Exodus 34 and we're going to look at verses 5 to 7. Exodus 34, 5 to 7. You will remember, and I mentioned this in part 1 of the sermon of this series, you will remember that Moses, while he's pleading, again, mediating for Israel, um, he says, at one point, he says, show me your glory. And it's not until Exodus 34, verses 5 to 7, that God actually does that. And so now, by completing verses 5, 6, and 7, we've read all the way from Exodus 34 through to verse 12. But let's read Exodus 34, verse 5. It says, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him, being Moses, and there proclaimed the Lord by name. The Lord passed by, the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love, loyal love and faithfulness, keeping loyal love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. There's kind of two parts to this revelation of God's character. The first part is his love and how he's so compassionate. And the second part is justice. By no means, by no means does he leave the guilty unpunished, responding to the, uh, responding to the transgressions of the fathers by dealing with children and children's children to the third and fourth generations. The essential nature of the law reveals the God of all love, and the God of justice. All intertwined, all embedded in this formation of a covenant relationship of which God's law is the basis. Which is why I believe that Jesus could say, let's go to Matthew 5. This is the scripture reading. I got ahead of myself. Matthew 5, verses 17 to 20. 
Jesus could say, do not think I have come to abolish or to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish these things, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter will pass away, will pass from the law until everything takes place. So anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys them and teaches others to do so will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness goes beyond that of the experts in the law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The only way Jesus can say that your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the law of the, of the uh, scribes, of the Pharisees, of the experts in the laws, is if they understand the law to be the law of love. God's law of love, which reveals his character, his values, who he is. Thus, the Bible establishes that the eternal nature that the eternal nature, it establishes the eternal nature of the commandments, the eternal nature of the law of God, which is fulfilled in Jesus. We can thus say the law is the most wonderful revelation ever made by God to men because it was fulfilled in the life of Jesus. And properly understood without the covenant, Without the Ten Commandments, we cannot be restored to God with us. The law, the covenant, fulfilled in Jesus, by Jesus, is the basis of our hope for eternal security and our hope for being restored to union with God. God with us. To be in His special presence again. I hope that as we think about these themes here, we'll realize that the beauty and the power of the law comes not only from the fact that it's the basis of our relationship with God, love for God and love for man, but that it's fulfilled in Jesus. And we can live out His will in our life as we extend that love to Him and love to others, those around us.